So this talk uh, is uh, based basically on our work that we are doing, we are doing together with Enrico, it's work in progress. So we apologize uh, if uh, it's not really finished, but uh, we think that we have uh, a point at least. And uh, I just want to say that uh, uh, we are bracketing some discussion of the talk, the foundation of the pyro paradox, which is uh, uh, many physicists think that is a model of incarnation of the black hole information paradox. So, we are moving uh, uh, really uh, fast uh, in the black hole information paradox and uh, through, through the, the, the firewall paradox. Basically, our work wants to study the conceptual foundation of this paradox, the firewall paradox and its resolution, and uh, study the, inconsistent, the consistency of uh, the black hole complementarity program. Uh, I will explain in a while what this means. So let me start just giving some uh, introduction and motivation for our work. So first of all, as we also said before, why studying black hole physics? Uh, we also think that uh, black holes are uh, one of the best playgrounds to understand the principle of quantum gravity. They are uh, the few objects where uh, quantum gravitation, quantum effects and gravitational effects uh, are manifest. And uh, so they are the, the place where we should, uh, we should look for inconsistency between quantum field theory and general relativity and to take also some insights uh, on uh, uh, a future theory of quantum gravity. In this, uh, in this uh, talk, we will introduce a notion of casual structure, uh, which basically will go, is going to tell us uh, uh, whether two, two systems can be causally connected or not. And uh, this notion uh, will be a tool to better conceptualize some key features of black hole, black hole information paradox and uh, the firewall paradox itself. Then we will uh, uh, introduce the firewall paradox, also known as the AMS paradox, by the initial of its author, Almeri, Maro, Polsiski, and Saldi. And we will show, uh, by means of uh, causal structure, that uh, in their paper they have an implicit uh, core assumption, which we call space-time distinctness. And then we will look uh, at some uh, uh, approach that uh, is uh, resolved in the firewall paradox, which goes under the name of the RPR. Um, and we will look at the conceptual strategy that they use to resolve the paradox, uh, also thanks to the causal structure. Before starting, let, uh, let me briefly uh, say what we mean by the local information paradox. So the, the, the story begins, uh, as uh, Eric showed in 76 uh, with uh, Hawking. He was studying uh, basically um, quantum vacuum fluctuation across uh, the horizon of a black hole. And they show that uh, basically the, the black hole can emit some radiation and uh, it studies some features of this radiation and it showed that uh, this radiation should be thermal so that it cannot carry any information about the interior of the black hole. And this also means that if you throw something into the black hole, you cannot extract that information through the uh, radiation. Therefore, when the black hole totally evaporates, the information is lost. Uh, page in 93 uh, give a refined version of the paradox. Basically, he, he, he showed that uh, whatever you interpret the black hole as a statistical uh, system with n degrees of freedom, then this uh, is inconsistent with the working calculation. And this, is, this inconsistency uh, is uh, arising long before the evaporation time at uh, uh, approximately light half of lifetime for a Svashi black hole. So basically, uh, from the phase perspective, uh, the black hole, uh, black hole uh, should be, uh, black hole evaporation process should be unitary. In 93, then, uh, the black hole complementarity came up, which uh, basically, starting from the point of view, the black hole information uh, evaporation uh, should be unitary. Uh, they developed uh, a, a list of principles, qualitatively principles, that show how uh, an infolic of, of server experience uh, the black hole and uh, what it means to the black hole for the black hole to have uh, a unitary evaporation process. Then in 97, uh, Maldacena wrote his uh, most famous article about the DSP correspondence. And uh, basically from uh, that conjecture, the black hole evaporation, uh, uh, the unitarity of black hole evaporation is uh, trivial. Uh, since as uh, also we said before, um, uh, the ADS uh, plus a black hole uh, gravitational theory is dual to a CFT and the CFT is a unitary, so also the ADS uh, plus the black hole should be unitary. 
So from the point of view of the DST correspondent, unitarity is trivial. And uh, as Saskin wrote in a famous book, uh, Argentina won the war uh, since uh, Maldacena is from Argentina and basically solved uh, uh, the unitarity problem of the coal evaporation. However, um, uh, as also Eric was saying before, this tells us that uh, there should be unitarity, but not how uh, we, we expect to, to have unitarity, and in particular, what makes uh, the black hole evaporation process unitary, and how the Hawking calculation is wrong. In particular, uh, the several years later, uh, Almeri, Maro, Polzeski, and Sally proposed uh, uh, the fact that the black hole complementarity program, which was uh, trying to qualitatively explain these uh, answers to these questions, uh, is inconsistent. And basically, they show that uh, the event horizon of a black hole is not a smooth place in space time, but there should be a wall of fire. Um, and uh, that uh, basically black hole complementarity is inconsistent with some uh, basic principle of quantum mechanics. However, in the same year, uh, later on, Maldacena and Saskin proposed uh, the, the RPR conjecture, which basically solved uh, the firewall paradox, uh, at least in the case of eternal Madias black hole, as we are going to see. Um, and they show that unitarity can be achieved also with a smooth uh, black hole horizon. So basically what we are going to do in this talk is to analyze this uh, timeline from the point of view of the causal structure and uh, we will try to, to give a conceptual uh, foundation of the firewall paradox and uh, its resolution. So as uh, somebody was drawing before, this uh, should be <laughs> the Penrose diagram for an evaporating black hole. Um, as you can see uh, from the diagram, I uh, will try to have a spotlight. Yes. Okay, the reason one is uh, what is called the preformation reason, uh, the reason in which the black hole is formed. Then, uh, reason two is the evaporation reason, and OP basically showed that uh, in reason two, in the external of the black hole here, the radiation is perfectly thermal, so it doesn't have any information, and all information is stored in the interior of the black hole. And the reason three is the post-evaporation reason, and you see all the information of the, which uh, should be stored inside the black hole is uh, basically lost. Uh, this calculation, together with also phase article, are, uh, um, are, uh, are made in what we call the naive semi-classical approximation, meaning that uh, there are quantum fields uh, living on the smooth uh, the relativistic space-time. Uh, in order to, to, to review the, um, the, the refinement of a phase of, for the Hawking paradox, so let me just introduce a few concepts which maybe are uh, very well known. The, one, the first one is the microcanonical entropy. Uh, so if you interpret the, the black hole as a, um, a statistical mechanic system with 10 degrees of freedom, then you can define the micro, its the microcanonical entropy, which will be proportional to the number of microstates of the black hole with uh, this formula. So SMC, uh, microcanonical entropy, is the logarithm of the dimension of the Hilbert space which describes the black hole, which basically is the number of microstates of the black hole. On the other hand, one also can define the von Neumann entropy. This uh, is another kind of entropy which measures uh, the amount of entanglement between two systems. Uh, the microcanonical entropy is called in the modern literature coarse grained entropy, and the von Neumann entropy is called also fine grained entropy. Um, so, if you if you think of the black hole to be a, in a in a pure state uh, at the beginning, and then you let it evaporate. Uh, then you can consider two subsystems. One is the Hawking radiation and the other is the black hole. And uh, since uh, the black hole was in a pure state before evaporation, then the von Neumann entropy of the black hole and the von Neumann entropy of the Hawking radiation should be the same. So basically what happens is that uh, um, through time, the microcanonical entropy is decreasing since uh, the black hole is losing degrees of freedom and the microcanonical entropy is proportional to the number of degrees of freedom of the black hole. On the other hand, the von Neumann entropy is increasing uh, since uh, um, uh, the more Hawking quanta you have, the, the more they are, the Hawking radiation is entangled with the black hole. So we have these two behaviors, the microcanonical entropy and the von Neumann entropy. 
However, we have uh, what is called the page bound, uh, meaning that uh, the electronical entropy bounds uh, the von Neumann entropy for the very simple reason that uh, you cannot have more entangled uh, degrees of freedom than the, the degrees of freedom that you have. So if you have a system with five degrees of freedom, you cannot have six, six of them to be entangled. So in a way, it is uh, a simple formula which tells you that uh, uh, the von Neumann entropy should be bounded uh, by the microcanonical entropy. But you see uh, right away that uh, uh, there should be a time at which uh, uh, this bound uh, is saturated. I mean, because uh, the von Neumann entropy is increasing, the microcanonical entropy is uh, decreasing. So there should be a time that we call TT, page time at which the bound is saturated, uh, and the von Neumann entropy is equal to the microcanonical entropy. At this time, uh, the Hawking radiation cannot be entangled with the anymore with the black hole. Otherwise, uh, the von Neumann entropy uh, could still increase, uh, violating the bound. So the only possibility is that the late time Hawking radiation, so the uh, Hawking quanta emitted after the phase time, are entangled not with the black hole, but the, with the early time Hawking radiation. So the Hawking quanta emitted before the phase time. So there is an entanglement between constituent for the Hawking radiation. And this is the only way to preserve the, 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 the microcanonical bound. However, uh, this is in, in, contrast, in contrast with the Hawking calculation, which stated that uh, the, the Hawking radiation is perfectly thermal, therefore you cannot have entanglement between these constituents. So basically, page showed that there is an inconsistency between the unitarity of statistical mechanics and the effective theory description of the code. And uh, this uh, uh, inconsistency uh, arises long before the evaporation time because it arises at the page time TP, uh, which, uh, as I said, is approximately half a lifetime for a swash of the code. So uh, if, if we take seriously the SCFT correspondence, then uh, as I said, uh, we should understand that uh, the black hole uh, evaporation process is unitary and the calculation uh, of Hawking is wrong. So the von Neumann entropy of the black hole is following the page curve, but uh, still this does not tell us how the, the, the evaporation process uh, should be unitary and uh, where the open calculation is wrong. And this will be basically the focus of uh, our work. Uh, so now I will introduce what uh, is known as the firewall paradox. Before, I will tell you something about the whole complementarity program, which uh, basically is the simple idea that the interior and the exterior of the black hole are through no commuting description of the same physics. Then I will uh, introduce the AMS paradox or firewall paradox which threatens the consistency of the black hole complementarity program and shows that uh, this uh, list of principles of black hole complementarity are in contradiction with the monogamy of entanglement. Then I will introduce uh, the notion of causal structure, uh, which as I said, uh, tell us if two systems can be causally connected or not. And by means of this notion, I will analyze the conceptual strategy of the firewall paradox and then we show that they assumed implicitly a principle that we call space-time distinctness, distinctness that is not present, uh, present in uh, his uh, original formulation. And the, the violation of this principle will be the core feature of uh, the resolution of the firewall paradox. So let us start with the call complementarity. Um, the, this picture basically uh, shows what the call complementarity is. So on the left side, you see uh, the, an infolling observer falling into the black hole. Uh, it experiences uh, nothing out of the ordinary at the black hole horizon, passes through and uh, it goes down and eventually it dies uh, at the singularity. On the other end, a uh, distant observer sees the infolling observer burning at the, at the event horizon. So one can think that uh, these two descriptions are incompatible. Instead, from the point of view of the black hole complementarity program, these are just uh, two complementary non-communicating description of the, of the same physics. So the, the main point is that uh, no observer has access to both realities. Uh, so for the observer inside the black hole, the outside does not exist. Uh, and for the observer outside the black hole, the inside does not exist. So this is the key idea 
of uh, black hole complementarity. Uh, this, uh, this program can be stated more precise by means of uh, four postulates that uh, I'm going to read uh, just uh, for completeness. So for postulate one is uh, the process of formation or end evaporation of a black hole as viewed from uh, by a distant observer can be described entirely within the constant context of standard quantum theory. In particular, there exists a unitary S matrix which describes the evolution from falling matter to outgoing Hawking light radiation. Postulate two is that outside the stretched horizon, which is just uh, an imaginary horizon right uh, uh, away from the true event horizon, of a massive black hole, physics can be described to good approximation by a set of semi classical interpretations. Postulate three to a distant observer, a black hole appears to be a quantum system with discrete energy levels. The dimension of the subspace of states describing a black hole of mass m is the exponential of Bekenstein of entropy SMC. Postulate four, a free falling observer experiences nothing out of the ordinary when crossing the horizon until the singularity is approached. Another way to say this is that no observer ever detects a violation of the known laws of physics. So these, uh, these four postulates are what uh, uh, Saskin and a collaborator wrote to be the black hole complementary data. In uh, 2013, Almeri, Polchiski, uh, Marov, and Sally uh, showed that these four, po four postulates are in contradiction with uh, the monogamy of entanglement, so they are inconsistent and the black hole complementarity is lost. How they did it, so let me just define some, uh, some modes. So here you have B, which is an interior mode, so a mode in the interior of a black hole, this is the event horizon. Uh, L is a late radiation mode. I recall you that uh, by late radiation, we mean radiation, open radiation emitted after the phase time. E is early radiation mode, so uh, the uh, Hawking quantum emitted before the phase time. And basically, what uh, AMS did is to, to show that by postulate one and three, L and, L and D should be maximally entangled. So the red line represents entanglement in this figure. And they should be uh, maximally entangled because, as I said before, in order for the black hole to follow the page curve, uh, then the late uh, Hawking mode cannot be entangled with the anymore with the black hole, but they should be entangled with, uh, with the early radiation. Uh, on the other hand, also L and B by the four postulate of black hole complementarity should be entangled because uh, if uh, the horizon has good place in phase time, then locally it is uh, roughly ring space. And we know that uh, the right and the left words of ring space are uh, entangled. So also B and L should be entangled. So from postulate one and three, you have entanglement between L and, and D. From postulate two and four, you have entanglement between L and D. But uh, you have a principle from quantum mechanics which states that a quantum system can be maximally entangled with only one other system. So clearly, this uh, uh, is uh, in violation of uh, monogamy of entanglement since L is entangled with both B and D. And th this is the way the Almeri, Maro, Polcinti, and Salis shows that uh, the black hole complementarity program is inconsistent. However, to the Marco, Marco, yes? sorry yes. for the interruption. Yes, Can yes, you explain yes, better problem. why this violation of monogamy uh, implies the violation of complementarity? Yes. Okay. So basically, from the complementarity program, you have that uh, these two entanglements should be the entanglement should be the case. So uh, the four principle of black hole complementarity entails that both L and D and L and B should be entangled. So uh, basically, it follows that L should be entangled at the same time with both B and D. But this this is in contrast with the monogamy of entanglement because L can be entangled only with another degree of freedom, not two. And here, instead, you have uh, the tell is entangled with both B and D. Is it clear? OK, OK, thank you. Okay. Uh, so I was saying, however, uh, what AMS did is that they implicitly assumed that uh, B and D are two distinct systems. Uh, if they were just one system, then uh, L is entangled with only one system. But they seems to be two different, two distinct systems. And, uh, this, the justification was that 
they are space-like related. So two space-like related system seems to be distinct. Uh, uh, but we know what distinct means uh, from uh, quantum field theory. Distinct means that uh, the Pareto algebra of uh, two systems are mutually commuting. And basically there is the micro causality axiom which uh, connects the space-like separation and uh, mutual commutation. Basically it tells you that if you have uh, uh, two space-like separated region, chi and chi prime, their algebra of observable should commute. So uh, basically what is, is telling us that uh, uh, AMPS um, for deriving the black hole in black hole complementarity in consistency, the implicitly assumed uh, principle that we call space time distinctness, it states that the space like separated systems are distinct, distinct, i.e., they mutually commute. I will just uh, let you note that uh, this space time distinctness uh, relies, relies on uh, the locality property of uh, classical relativistic space time which have no guarantee to hold also at the quantum level. So uh, this move uh, should be at least justified better. And uh, what, we, what we are going to do in the following is to contest basically this principle. Can I ask one question before we yes. on from this diagram? Um, it's a yes. very basic question, but it seems to me from the diagram that over time the event horizon is growing. But as, as the black hole is evaporating, shouldn't it be shrinking? No, the, the, the time here uh, is not, um, maybe we, we, so here the time is not, uh, as I say, it's not, not really, uh, so th this is just a conformal Pernod's diagram and this is not the real time, let's say. If I, if I, if, so, if, if I may, if I may um, make a remark here, you should always, yes. you should you should be very, very careful when reading a conformal diagram. Conformal diagrams do not preserve space-time volume. Right, right, so right. This is the point. You should, you should, uh, they also do not preserve area. So you, you should never yes. draw a conclusion about relative, about relative volumes and relative areas by how things naively look on a conformal diagram. So in fact, right, right, right. As, as you move towards the singularity, uh, as you move up, or, up in the diagram straight up towards singularity, in fact, space-time space -time volume is shrinking exponentially. Uh, re right. Because the, the singularity is essential is essentially zero volume, so the conformal right, diagram right, right. Radically, radically distorts volume. Right, right, right. So okay. yeah, it, we wrote time, but uh, it's only the time yeah, we wrote it just uh, to to intuitively uh, let you uh, understand that L is a late time of radiation and E is a early time of radiation. But probably we should uh, uh, cancel these uh, these uh, these things because uh, it can be misplaced. Okay, thanks for the question. Should I move on? Yes, yes, please. Yes. Uh, so uh, let me now introduce uh, what we call causal structures. Um, and uh, this will be the tool that we will use to analyze the, the AMS paradox and this resolution. So we, by causal structure, we mean uh, just that uh, given a theory T, we, said, we say that uh, the causal structure of the theory T is given by a set of space-time region objects with their physical state and the relation R which determines if two objects, the region of space-time, can or cannot be causally related. So by means of this, this uh, general definition, we can define the causal structures of space-time. Uh, here, uh, the, th the theory T is just a general relativity the object are space-time points and uh, the relation R is R and C of uh, being connected by a causal curve, which just means that uh, two points P and Q of space-time are causally related if there is a causal curve connecting them. On the other end, one can also define uh, the entanglement causal structure. So here yeah, the theory T is quantum field theory, the objects are quantum systems, and the relation R and E are, is the relation of B maximally entangled, in this case of uh, AMPS. And uh, basically, we say that two, two quantum systems, P and Q, are connect, causally connected if there is an entanglement between them. Let me stress that here we, we talk about, about causal structure uh, for ease of the exposition, but we don't really mean any account of uh, strong account of causality. We mean just that there are robust counterfactual correlation between the objects of uh, the causal structure relation. 
So we, we, we are not uh, uh, talking really about any stronger account of causation than that. So let me now rephrase uh, the, the arms paradox in terms of causal structure. We are, it seems that we have uh, um, a causal connection between L and B uh, with the relation R and E because L and B are entangled. We seem also to have a causal connection between L and D uh, because L and, and D are entangled. And then we seem to, to not have a causal connection between B and C because uh, L, uh, B and C are space-like separated. And together with the assumption of space-time distinctness, uh, space-like separation means that they are distant. So from this point of view, you can uh, immediately see how to resolve the firewall products. The, the first uh, uh, straightforward solution is to drop the first line. And this is what uh, basically the firewall people did. Uh, they, they drop the problematic entanglement between L and B. And basically by dropping the problematic entanglement between L and B, uh, they solve the monogamy problem because the L and B, uh, L is entangled with only E. Uh, dropping this condition means that uh, the event horizon is not uh, anymore a smooth place in space time, but instead uh, there should be something which breaks the entanglement between B and L. And what they, did, they, they propose is that uh, there is a wall of fire uh, uh, which uh, prohibits uh, this uh, kind of entanglement connection. Another way to resolve the paradox is to drop the second line of uh, this, uh, this argument. And this is what basically Hawking, without knowing it, uh, was doing. So if uh, uh, there is no entanglement, the, the, the late and the early Hawking radiation means that uh, the, there is no uh, firewall paradox because L and B are, uh, L is entangled only with B, but uh, for L to be entangled with D, it means that uh, the von Neumann black hole, um, von Neumann entropy of the black hole continues to grow in time. Therefore, we have uh, a, a non unitary evaporation of uh, black hole, which, if we believe in a DSFT, uh, cannot be the case. So we, we know from a DSFT, if uh, the DSFT conjunction is true, that uh, the, the the before the evaporation process should be used. Another way out of this problem is to drop the fourth line, meaning that uh, B and D are not two distinct systems. And this is what uh, basically uh, Maldacena and Saskin did uh, for the resolution of the paradox. And uh, Enrico is going to tell you more about this. Thank you, Marco. Uh, can you please give me the control? Yes. Yeah, you're right. Okay, thank you. So, uh, thanks, Marco. Uh, so, as Marco perfectly explained, now we have uh, what we call the arms paradox or the firewall paradox, and we are going to look at how, within the RFPR conjecture, we can resolve this this paradox and avoid the the, um, the appearance of firewall horizon of the code. So, we start here by briefly reviewing how we are going to approach this problem. We will first look at what the RPR conjecture says and basically what the RPR conjecture says is a, an equivalence between entangled states and wormhole geometries. Then we are going to look at the instantiation of the RPR conjecture in the context of the eternal ADS black hole. And there we are going to construct a firewall-like situation where we see again an apparent violation of the monogamy of entanglement. And again, uh, it should be stressed that this is not strictly speaking the same situation as in the Arms paradox, because the Arms paradox is formulated from uh, gravitational bla from black holes formed from gravitational collapse and evaporating. The eternal DS black hole is neither of these, but it is a very useful playground to make sense of issues in the context of a DSCFT and uh, the RPR conjecture, and as such, it gives us the hint of how to resolve the, uh, the problem. Then we are going to look at how what we call the generalized causal structure uh, resolve, resolves the firewall paradox by engineering a violation of space-time distinctness, which does not uh, work as an assumption anymore. And then we are, lastly, we are going to see how this violation of SD seems to give a, a, a form, a precise form of the basic intuition behind black hole complementarity. So let us start with the RPR conjecture. So here you can see 
a basic uh, representation of the idea behind the ERPR. So yeah, uh, here we have two regions of space and we have a wormhole connecting them. And you can see two small uh, quantum systems which are entangled, the red line represents entanglement. And the idea behind the, R the RPR conjecture is that there is an equivalence, as I said before, between entangled states and possibly quantum wormhole geometry. We have two versions of the RPR. The modest view, what Sask in the 2016 calls the modest view, which is that uh, this conjecture thing obtains only in the context of entangled black holes. So all the entangled black holes are equivalent to wormhole geometries and vice versa. And then the ambitious view, which is that in some future conception of quantum geometry and quantum gravity, we will be able to think of any entangled system as being connected by some kind of Planckian, possibly Planckian wormhole, whereby Planckian we simply mean of uh, uh, Planckian size, of, uh, where in a wormhole in a regime where, where quantum gravity is needed to make sense of the geometry. So the simplest example of this conjecture is the eternal ADS black hole where we can, uh, where we need only semi-classical geometry to make sense of this conjecture, but where we are going to see, this is important, that the naive semi-classical picture of space-time that Marco uh, perfectly explained before is not anymore a, an, a viable uh, way to describe the space-time. So we start by with the Perros diagram of an eternal ADS black hole. An eternal ADS black hole is a large, in this case we have a large black hole. We say that it is a two-sided system because it has two horizons and thus two exterior regions. We have the left exterior region L and the right exterior region R. And we have two horizons, the left horizon and the right horizon. And I'm sorry, Marco. Oh, okay, so my, my screen froze for a second, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, the connection is not the best. Um, so as I was saying, we have two horizons. We also, we also have an eternal black hole, meaning that this black hole has always existed. It was not formed from gravitational collapse, but it was always there. And it is always going to be there, which means that it is not an evaporating black hole. It does not evaporate. Uh, the eternal ADS black hole is holographically dual to two copies of the CFT which are located on the boundary of the eternal ideas black hole, the right and left CFT, one in, on the right boundary and one of the, in the, on the left boundary. And these two CFTs are in an entangled state, which is the thermophile double, the famous thermophile double state, which is this state here, where uh, beta is the inverse temperature, E is just an energy eigenstate, and J is in the left CFT, while, R, uh, while uh, JL is a state in the left CFT while JR is a state in the right CFT. So these black holes have a dual interpretation. We can either interpret these as two horizons connected by a wormhole, and this is quite clear if you trace some kind of space-like slice of this geometry, you can see that there is a space-like bridge between the left and the right horizon, or either as two disconnected entangled black holes where we simply take, this is clear, most clearly seen from the thermophile double state, where we take the right CFT to describe as a black hole, the left CFT to describe another black hole, and then since we are in thermophile double state, we have entanglement between them. And this is maybe the most basic instance of the idea of VRPR, in the sense that you have, that you have in the eternal DS black hole, this dual interpretation, which uh, gives us an equivalence between uh, this, uh, a, ge a wormhole geometry and a pair of entangled quantum systems in this case two black holes. So let us construct a firewall here. Of course, since the black hole is not collapsing, it's not evaporating and it's not far from collapse, this is, strictly speaking, will not be the same firewall as AMPS, but it will be good enough to see at least the basic conceptual picture. So we start, by taking two maximally entangled qubits A and B across the right horizon. So the red line here represents entanglement and then A and B are simply two qubits. Then we evolve, uh, we apply a CPT transformation to A. Uh, sorry, I should mention that both A and B are at time T. Then we apply a CPT transformation on A. This gives us a, another qubit A prime at time minus t, which is the CPT transform of A. 
we need holographic view LA first. Now uh, we are at time minus t since a is entangled with b, also a prime is entangled with b since we have simply applied the CPT transformation. So this should not uh, eliminate entanglement. It is also quite clear from the Penrose diagram that if we can evolve forwards in time a prime using the semi-classical bulk equations of motion into a. We write this as you see in the slide. Uh, in the picture, it is a blue line. And in the slide, it is simply written as a first arrow a. Then, since a is a qubit, we have that the Pauli relations hold between its, its Pauli matrices. And then we have that uh, the Pauli matrices which make up a do not commute. But then, since a first evolves in a using simply the bulk equations of motion, we also have that a prime does not commute with a. Okay, so to do this, we have relied crucially on the fact that you can view these uh, the, the two uh, horizons as connected by a wormhole. This was crucial because we have applied the CPT transformation, which has taken us from the interior to the left exterior. And then in particular, we have evolved forwards in time through effectively the wormhole using the bulk equations of motion to get from A first to A. Now we rely, and this is a strength of the RPR conjecture, now we evolve simply using the left CFT Hamiltonian, uh, the qubit A prime up to time t, which gives us a new qubit, which we call A double prime. This is possible because uh, since we can also view the system as two disconnected black holes, we don't expect anything that we do on the left with the left Hamiltonian to be influenced by what happens on the right, and which is encoded in evolution by the right Hamiltonian. So we do not need to be to worry about what goes on on the right. We can simply evolve forward in time. We get a double prime at time t. A double prime here in yellow is geographic dual of a qubit on the left stretched horizon of the black hole. And again, we write this with a prime arrow a double prime. Now, since A prime is entangled with B, by the same argument that we had before, we have simply evolved forwards in time, we have the, also A double prime should be entangled with B. So this is our firewall-like situation. Since we have at MT, two qubits, A double prime and A, which are both maximally entangled with B, but which are far apart from one another. So they naively cannot be identified which violates monogamy since B is now entangled with two distinct systems at the same time. But then the, the solution is almost immediately at our hand. Since we have that A first evolved in A by what we said before, and we also have by what I've just said now that A first evolves in A double, in, uh, that A prime evolves in A double prime, then this means that we can also write that A double prime evolves in A. This is simply backwards evolution in time with the left CFT Newtonian from A double from A double prime to A prime, and then from sorry, A double prime in A prime, and then forwards in time, what we have seen before in A. But then this implies, as we have seen before, that also A double prime does not commute with A. So we have so we have no violation of monogamy. Since A and the double prime are not distinct systems, since the operator algebras do not commute, as we have seen, uh, are not mutually commutative. So B is not really entangled with two distinct systems. It is really entangled with a single system, which is, however, which, however, uh, exists, uh, is manifested in a non local way, if you want, at least from the perspective of what we have called the naive semi classical approximation. So where is your firewall now? Well, the RPR, as we have seen, resolves the paradox thanks to the fact that there is a, that there is a wormhole connecting the two horizons. So this new connection is neither captured by RLC, since we are not talking about a causal curve, since these are just based like connected systems, nor RME, since it is crucial that a, a double prime and they are not entangled with, with one another. We instead claim that this new connection is captured by a new relation, which we call RWH, which defines what we call the generalized causal structure, and which leads to a violation of SD. So let me speak briefly about what we mean by generalized causal structure. Here by generalized causal structure, we mean a causal structure where the background theory 
is uh, not further specified, though you can think of this as a DSCFP if you like, theory of quantum gravity. Uh, I should just mention that the RPR is supposed to apply quite more generally than to a DSCFP. But since you are speaking about the DSCFP, you can just, this is why we say quantum gravity in general. But if you want, you can uh, obviously think of a DSCFP there. The relation is WH, which is the relation of being non-trivially connected, which uh, obtains if and only if uh, we have two systems which are uh, connected by rob robust correlations, and then the objects are just quantum systems. So the AMS paradox was the result of superposing RLC with RME. So superposing the entanglement causal structure with the space-time causal structure. This is, from our point of view, the core of what is meant uh, by naive uh, semi-classical approximation. It is simply taking the space-time picture, the space-time structure coming from general relativity and simply adding on top of it quantum fields. So ERAPR shows that this cannot be and is not the right causal structure for a theory of quantum gravity, if you are correct in our analysis. We need to use instead the generalized causal structure where the relevant relation is given by RWH and where there is no paradox. So do we get back black hole complementarity? Well, the forward paradox, as we have seen, depends on the assumption of space-time distinctness. Uh, this assumption, in the end, however, was never reasonable for those who depend on the DHC. Remember that as we have uh, characterized the core intuition uh, behind the black hole complementarity, this intuition was that uh, the interior and the exterior are just two non-commuting descriptions of the same physics. So it's the, it does not seem reasonable to regard the interior and the exterior as distinct systems from our point of view. Indeed, a more careful construction of the interior shows that the interior and exterior are two, indeed two non-commuting descriptions of the same physics, which was this intuition. It is precisely these properties the fact that the interior and the exterior are not distinct systems, as we have seen, that engenders the violation of space and distinctness, avoiding the AMS paradox, and this is exactly what is captured by the generalized causal structure given by RWH. Thus, in the end, black hole complementarity has been saved by RPR coupled with, the, with generalized causal structure. So, uh, just as a as a, as a look on the future. Uh, as Marcus correctly pointed out, this is part of the larger project. So uh, together with the uh, RPR in the Terminal DS Black Hole, we have already looked at generalizations of the RPR conjectures beyond the, the case of the Eternal DS Black Hole, which were which are the state-dependent constructions of the interior of Podorimas and Raju, and in particular, Pennington works on evaporating black holes which both exhibit the, the same features, the same qualitative features that you have described in the context of the eternal DS black hole and thus seem to uh, lend some degree of evidence to uh, our analysis, if, if at least it's possible for philosophy. Um, we also want to look at the paradoxes of the interior, which are the AMS paradox and the marrow fold paradox, which uh, seem to threaten the possibility of encoding the interior in the boundary CFP, or in more general quantum systems, what um, Maldacena calls the central dogma to some extent. And then we want to compare more in detail uh, from without relying on, on holography, uh, ERPR with the firewall approach. And in particular, this would rely on some recent advances in the study of the gravitational path integral and in classical gravity, and in particular uh, on work on so-called replica wormholes. And then we would also like to, to look at, uh, to extend this work uh, uh, with some philosophical implications about quantum black holes, in particular with the relation between the interior of the black hole and the exterior, and how much the, of, the, of the interior can be recovered by an exterior observer, and to look at locality, at the issue of locality in quantum gravity. And thank you. And <laughs> be careful not to fall into a black hole, possibly. Time. We have plenty of time for, for questions. You can uh, ask to do a question in the chat as usual. 
if no one else has um, spoken up yet, I, I might like to go ahead and ask. So um, I'm curious how how seriously, it, um, on your understanding of uh, ER equals EPR, how seriously do you take the picture of a wormhole? It seems to me that on the one hand, you have to take it very seriously, or else you're just simply redescribing quantum entanglement using different words, and haven't and haven't actually gained and haven't actually gained anything. But if you do take it very seriously, then you run into the problem that wormholes require enormous amounts of negative energy to maintain to be maintained, and there is no known physical mechanism for producing such enorm such enormous continu uh, continued amounts of, of negative energy. So uh, how, uh, how how do you think that how do you think that uh, we're supposed to square that? Uh, how, how, how does that problem, how do you guys think of that problem? Okay. Uh, Marco, do you want to go or do I go? Uh, if you can go, then I can Okay. Answer, so. <laughs> okay, so I'll, uh, I'll try to answer it, at least to the best of my understanding. So, um, in the context of the eternal IDS black hole, we take it quite seriously. Um, it should be noted that, uh, as far as I understand, um, to be man uh, wormers to be maintained they require a lot of negative energy if you want them to be tra traversable, if I'm not mistaken. Here we're speaking about non-traversable wormholes, however. So uh, I, I, know, I know of only one exact model of a non-traversable non uh, wormhole that does not massively violate all the known energy conditions. Okay. And, that one, and, and that one is, ma is manifestly nothing like the, uh, the wormhole yeah. you have in the, in the in the uh, in the eternal ADS yeah. uh, ADS black hole, uh, every single whether traversable or not, every exact model of wormhole that I know of require except for this one requires yeah. massive violations of, of of energy of every energy condition. No, okay, yeah, mm, okay, I understand. So here, um, well, what we call the wormhole is really the shared interior, if you want. Wormhole is a is a is a nice way to see it, say this. If uh, in this sense. If by wormhole you mean something extremely precise, then yeah, we simply mean the shared interior. So we do not take as take it as seriously as you might want. Um, for the non, um, and I would expect if you want that also in the um, in the more general uh, cases, for example, for operating black holes, you get something similar. So uh, I have in mind here some work by Maldacena, Almeri, and all the group and Princeton. Uh, where they studied two-dimensional gravity, JT gravity, with uh, conformal matter, and uh, all the issues about the island, the, the, the island rule for calculating the entropy. And there you see that the connection is the, in the three-dimensional ADS dual to the, the two-dimensional conformal matter. So uh, I would say that what we mean by wormhole here is maybe more along the lines of a shared interior, if you want not maybe strictly speaking what you have in mind when you talk about warm. I don't know if this is uh, satisfying or, or maybe if Marco has something more to say in this, in this case. Uh, just uh, that, uh, I mean, the warm picture is uh, true only in the eternal yes, black hole, yeah. which is not a physical state, a physical case. So if, if you move to one side of black hole, so to black hole really evaporating, <laughs> because this was a uh, eternal black hole, so we just made up a firewall-like situation just uh, really a solution of the evaporation and black hole process. So if you move to the black hole evaporation, there you just uh, uh, see that the, at the quantum level, the semi-classical semi picture is uh, violated. So the classical features of space-time, the locality property of space-time are not there anymore. You need uh, uh, some non-local connectivity uh, in, the, in the picture of space-time, and then you can think of them as a, a quantum or more, but this is just yeah. uh, I'd say a speculative word to say that there are non-local connectivity in space-time, and this is not a non-local connectivity because uh, uh, I mean it's a local connectivity like the one of entanglement, so information cannot uh, pass over. Okay, let's say. So, well, that's, my, uh, that's, my, that's my concern: is that, the, okay. is that when you say there is a non-local quantum connectivity to space-time. All you're doing is just saying entanglement using different words. You're not actually giving a real physical story. Uh, no, I'm so, okay. oh, sorry, Mark. Right, right. right. Please you, go. you can go. You can. <laughs> no. Please. no, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, I just wanted to say that 
from our perspective, the, the non-local connectivity is not mediated uh, by entanglement, on the other hand. So um, a, 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 what we call a double prime and they are not entangled. So the, the supposed non-local connectivity is not, a, in a, strictly speaking, an entanglement relation. So th th this is actually quite important. If it was an entanglement relation, that we would not solve the problem in a, in a very important way. So, but please, Marcus, say what, what you're doing. Right. No, just uh, maybe speculative, but it's, it's like uh, through the SFT, say, if you want to believe for, through the SFT, to ICT, the space-time heredity uh, inherits uh, some entanglement properties of the conformality theory, but then it, they become really properties of space-time. And um, I just want to add uh, a thing that maybe Enrico said at the end. Uh, last uh, November, uh, people from uh, Princeton and Stanford, they wrote together a paper showing that uh, these properties, these features, are not uh, really um, stated only in the ADSFT correspondence, but they showed that uh, the, the, these, uh, these things that is just explained are properties of the gravitational particle integral. So it really seems that, uh, I, I mean, to our understanding, uh, there is something uh, going on that uh, should be at least uh, took in consideration, let's say. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for the question, Thanks. Eric. Yeah. Are there other questions? I take advantage to to pose the question to uh, uh, three of you, uh, both of you and, uh, and Eric. <laughs> um, I, I I had the feeling, uh, listening Eric uh, presentation, that. Uh, you are saying something from an ontological point of view a bit similar to what was the interpretation of quantum mechanics by Patrick Supis. The idea of, of Supis was that uh, uh, quantum mechanics, uh, uh, the fundamental uh, equation of quantum mechanics are deterministic, that is Schrodinger equation, and uh, indeed uh, quantum, mechanic, uh, quantum mechanic phenomena showed to us that there is an uh, in the determination, in determinism, and we have not, we have uh, not yet uh, a clear presentation of this determination in, in determinism in quantum mechanics, in, in microphysical phenomena, and uh, so entanglement, measuring problem, all this stuff uh, uh, is a consequence of our inability to understand and to write correct equation, to correct indeterministic equation. And in a certain sense, you, uh, I, I understood, I am not sure, but you said something similar about space-time. At the end of the day, when we go to the Planck scale, there is something essentially statistical that uh, perhaps can be make uh, uh, compatible quantum mechanics and uh, general relativity, that is continuity and discontinuity. Uh, on the contrary, it seems to me that uh, in the approach by Enrico and, uh, and Marco, there is a different uh, ontology, a different general metaphysics, influential uh, metaphysics, uh, to, to use uh, Popper's word. That is, they, are, they have the idea that uh, at the end of the day, space-time is something that emerged from uh, a physical connection, a deeper physical connection, uh, that in a certain sense, uh, EPR, ER conjecture have at least partially uh, caught. That is, it, pr probably ER, EPR uh, conjecture is not uh, the final theory, but uh, it is uh, scratches the surface of, of a problem of a relational, a really relational interpretation of space time. Is that is a presentation of, this, of the two different uh, metaphysical program of view and Eric uh, correct or is completely uh, a misunderstanding? So, M Marco, Enrico, do you want do you want to go first? Uh, <laughs> oh well, I, I, I'll only speak for myself and maybe Marco. 
uh, if, if he's brave enough to let me speak uh, for for him. But um, I think that what you have, uh, well, I, I think that what you have said about what we think, uh, how we think about matters, at least for us, is uh, is reasonable. I mean that that reasonably captures what we think about this. Um, in the sense that we ultimately think that there is, a, if you want, um, some type of deeper uh, type of connectivity, a deeper type of structure. The, the idea of the generalized causal structure, what we call that, uh, kind of hints at that. There is type of uh, there is a kind of uh, more more general and more uh, and deeper connectivity. Which, from which what we call space time and what we call quantum mechanics ultimately emerge. But yeah, no, I, th I think that's fair. And I don't know if Marco agrees, but I think that's quite fair in terms of what we believe about this. I, I don't want to speak <laughs> for what Eric believes about this because <laughs> it's, it's not my place. I, I, try very hard, I try very hard to remain agnostic about these issues. Um, I, I just, just, just by temperament, um, I'm not, I, I, I don't normally think of things um, uh, using, uh, I don't normally think of these philosophical problems uh, formu formulated in the terms of ontology. That's, the, that, that's just, that, I tend to think, I, I, I tend to be much more pragmatic in my approach to uh, these kinds of questions. So I, I, I'm not opposed to formulating, to, formu to trying to formulate something like an exact ontology to try and articulate, to try and, and, and pose the question and study it. I just would request that we always keep in mind that these investigations are extraordinary, are deeply, deeply speculative. And we should be very, we should be very careful. So I, I personally, I, I mean, if, if I were gonna bet a beer on, uh, on the question, I would say probably, yeah, if you, when you get down to some deep level, when you get down to some very, very small scale, some very high energy scale, Probably both theories, you know, general relativity and quantum field theory, both failed, both failed dramatically, and we're going to need some radically different kind of structure uh, to represent what's going on. And it may very well be something like um, ER equals EPR. It may very well be that what we normally think of as relativi relativistic space-time causal structure and quantum mechanical entang entanglement actually arise from uh, the, from uh, the, the same underlying unified structure. That would be very beautiful. Um, I just think right now, given the, uh, given the uh, severe lack of constraint by empirical data, we're really just shooting in the dark. And I, I, I tend to be very old fashioned and conservative and curmudgeonly about this idea, <laughs> especially compared to a lot of philosophers and certainly compared to a lot of theoretical physicists these days. I, want I like empirical data. I like experiments. <laughs> <laughs> Theorizing blindly, the theorizing freely—it's—it's it's beautiful, it's fun. You know, but let's just take, let's just put on the brakes a little bit and remember that that none of this is actually constrained by any novel empirical data that we can't otherwise explain. And that's, uh, that's really neat. Yes, Eric, my, I, my, I, my, my the, the the most important mission of your coming in Reno was this one that is saying the last uh, proposition you said to Enrico Marco. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> you you accomplished your mission. <laughs> also, <laughs> also, it is uh, online. But um, there is a, a couple of questions more. Uh, uh, Querenberg, I don't know your first name. Uh, sorry. Renate. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, hello. Thank you. I, my question is about the dimension, dimensionality of space. Uh, if you use uh, the Zeta space, others with the Zeta space, it goes back to the discussion between Einstein and the Zeta to the uh, 1916 to 18. And then we have Theodor Kaluza and then um, De Broglie was very happy to um, find out that uh, five dimensional space works very well for matter waves. So I don't understand. Can you please tell me what is how um, your approach adding to this old problem and why wasn't it considered to be solved already in the 20s? Uh, Marco, uh, do you want to? I don't think I really understand the question. So if you did, uh, please go. Uh, what kind of, what, um, uh, 
what role does uh, the uh, space dimension play in your uh, theory? I mean, it's Makatena is speaking about five dimensional space yeah. and brain, yeah. brain world concept. And I didn't find um, uh, hints to this in your um, space time uh, um, drawings. Okay, you want to go and read or I can? No, the go then I'll, uh, I'll complete what you say. If, uh, if there's anything so, else. So here, uh, the, the, the idea of safety conjecture is, uh, is a conjecture with string theory. And the, the dimension of the idea space is five and the dimension of the conformal field theory is four. What we did in this presentation is not making use of uh, the idea CFT, but just we just used the, the ER EPR conjecture. So with more on a level of uh, semi-classical physics mm -hmm. and, uh, and therefore you, you don't see there the, really the dimensional space time it was just an idea that we employed uh, in, in this context. But then if you want uh, to, to know which are the dimensionality of the space in, in, within the DSCT correspondence is that the idea space has a four space dimension one time and the conformal field theory in the boundary has a free space dimension at one time. Did this answer the question? Uh, thank you. You're welcome. Yes, this is independent from string theory. Yes, uh, Damon. Damon Molle. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes we can. Okay. You. Thank you. Naive question from a philosopher. Um, I had seen Suskin talk about ER equals EPR earlier, and he seemed to claim at the time that there was no violation of monogamy of entanglement because A was in a separate space time from B and E, um, and monogamy relies on causal structure and a frame of simultaneity. And A being in the else when means that there is no violation. Is that, was that an earlier idea of his or, or I, I kind of got lost where you were going through that part of the argument. So, um, well, what we have, what, what we have presented, so that the firewall like situation, what we have called the firewall like situation is, uh, well, in, in a sense, it is almost a counter example to this claim of Saskin, um, if, if you made, uh, if you, this is what he said, in the sense that uh, their monogamy is clearly violated, um, despite uh, what we call a, a, a double prime and A being technically in different, uh, well, uh, a, a is in the interior, while A double prime is in the, is in the left exterior there. But since they are both ent maximally entangled with B, you still have a violation of monogamy. Strictly speaking, uh, monogamy means that at a certain time t, you have uh, um, at a certain time t, you have two uh, you have three max uh, three systems, two of which are maximally entangled with one. So um, so this does not uh, say anything about uh, whether or not they are um, in, in the same space time or not. I mean, to some extent, of course, they have to be in, in, in the same space time, at least in the sense that they have to be uh, in, the, in the same geometrical structure as we have, as we have seen in the Sarah Diaz black hole. But no, as far as I can understand, no mention, for example, of causal horizons, which I think is what was behind the, the, that observation. It, it's made in the principle. so. Um, that, that there should still be a violation even if one is in the left exterior and one is, the, is in the right exterior, for example. At least as far as I can understand, of course, asking knows better than me. So. Marco, do you want to add anything? No, I, I agree with, uh, with what you said. Uh, yes, basically, if uh, this what asking uh, said, it seems to be, uh, to be wrong. The, the solution of the paradox is that uh, uh, the two systems uh, with which uh, the, the, the other is entangled with, uh, they are not distinct, but they are the same system. So this, uh, this is how the RPR resolves the firewall paradox. Does this clarify other the questions? 
Sorry? No, I just wanted to ask if this answered the question, just to, to make sure okay. that I clarified everything. No yes, one? Yeah, okay. that, that was an answer. I'm not sure I agree, but it was an answer. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Oh, thank okay. you.